Well, yeah. Welcome everybody uh, to this uh, second meeting of the Economic Policy Working Group. So happy to have Casey Mulligan here all the way from Chicago, a cold country after the nice weather. The weather is very nice here, so I appreciate that. And um, you'll be, we'll be talking about opioid pricing and the dynamics of public health. I can't think of something more difficult, more important to do. But Casey was here, I just looked it up just about a year ago, January 19th. He spoke about the backward art of slowing the spread. We'll see if there's a relationship with a one year that's gone by. But Casey is a visiting fellow at Hoover. He's a professor at Chicago and uh, most welcome. So you may have a few questions as you go, but get started. Yeah, we should uh, be a dialogue. And I got to build a logical structure here, so I wouldn't want to lose anybody in the beginning, uh, in the middle. So, um, now we sent around a paper, but what I, I thought it'd be better for you guys and maybe for, for me too to bring together a couple of different papers and focus on what they have to say about the dynamics of public health. I'm going to start with a uh, macro picture. This shows life expectancy over the past 40 years. And this really is a macro picture because every single person in the United States contributes to that number. And life expectancy has been increasing for years. You could go back even before this picture. Life expectancy is increasing. Really, that's you can make the argument that's the major story of economic growth and living standards. But recently, that trend, and this is all pre pandemic. That trend not only stopped, but reversed uh, or turned negative. And opioids have a lot to do with that. I've kind of circled it. It's not a bright line and when the opioid issue uh, be became serious, but I've kind of circled the opioid years here. And I, opioids had been used at the level they were used in say the year 2000, you wouldn't have had that drop, in fact, the increase would have, some kind of increase would have continued. I wanna make the case today that um, we can understand a lot of this by looking at really increasing returns in opioid consumption at the individual level. And there's three, in the time we have, I wanna focus on three results of that increasing returns perspective. Once you get something that looks like a diffusion curve, or right? if you saw just the quantity data over time, you might call it an ep epidemic. It's not that there's anything contagious underlying the process, although maybe there is, uh, but it's a, just a nonlinear dynamics. The second finding, where there's gonna be a group of findings, is it can look like the opioid demand curves slopes the wrong way, meaning you increase an opioid price and people respond by consuming more opioids. And we'll be able to talk about when that happens. That's not something that would expect to happen all the time in all situations, but I'll kind of lay out the parameters for when that can happen. And then some surprising <coughs> corollaries to that, like why the race gap would change sign over time why and when and among whom. And then the third set of results I think we'll have time for is to understand why fatality rates from opioids would diverge for youth and adults. So a single price change can reduce mortality among youth while increasing it among adults. And so we'll, that single framework is gonna say all three of these things. So I'm gonna begin with the consumer budget set from microeconomics, um, and I have the quantity of opioids on the horizontal axis and the vertical axis has the quantity of all other goods. And in my setup, there's gonna be two sources of that Q opioids. One source is gonna be prescriptions and the other source will be illicit manufacturers, especially you read about it in the news, they will refer, refer to heroin and tons of illicitly manufactured fentanyl. Now what I've drawn here first in red is, well, let's suppose for a moment that we only had one source instead of two sources, just prescriptions. Then we have a usual budget set, whatever the price of prescription is, 
you buy more prescriptions, you have less of other goods at a more or less a constant rate. But now maybe there's a second option, the illicitly manufactured option of getting opioids. And this option has a fixed cost for the individual consumer, maybe also at the market level, but for the individual consumer it does. And it's, I think of this relating to euphemistically, I'll call it self-dosing skills, um, measuring these small quantities, using a needle on yourself. This is a, something you gotta get used to. And once you're able to do that, then you have these extra opportunities that open up. Now, the way I've drawn it here, the marginal price is lower for the illicitly manufactured. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, many years, in many situations, it's not that way. And then they wouldn't cross like this. Um, and we want to pay attention. Well, when what situations is the marginal price of illicit less than the <coughs> marginal price of prescriptions? Then we can bring in preferences and think about choices. I've drawn one type of outcome here, choices on B. Person chooses uh, prescriptions as their source, and that picture shows the quantity that they choose. Um, but then in this picture, we can look at well, what would happen if there were an increase in the price of prescriptions? We're going to rotate the red budget set and look what happens. And this, the way I drew it here, people buy more opioids because it now it justifies switching to that cheaper source. And then they um, they respond by buying more. So that's the first kind of preview of the demand curve kind of appearing to slope the wrong way. It's not that I've featured irrational people or somebody with weird preferences. They just have these two options and this really nonlinear budget set. So now let me go back to the budget, just the budget set. Take the preferences <clears throat> off of there for a second. It's going to give our first glimpse of maybe of the increasing returns. There's a critical quantity here, Q star, where if you're going to be above that quantity, you want to source from the illicit manufacturer. If you're going to be below the quantity, you want to source from the prescriptions. So you're, we have a situation here where the high quantity people face a lower price and the low, low quantity people face a higher price. That's the source of the increase in returns. That's normally, normally not the way we think about supply and demand issues, when you, when you buy more, you're gonna, the price is gonna rise on you, but here it's gonna fall. That's why I'm using the phrase increasing returns. Now, this is important enough, I wanted to show the same idea, same model in a different place, so space. So I'm gonna change the vertical axis from all other goods, a quantity into a price or a, a marginal cost. Easy. Yeah. Would it be useful to have a vertical segment at the, uh, you know, at the beginning, the right hand side of the black line, and then have the lower slope? Because that seems to be more of what you're describing. There's a fixed yeah. cost, and then you have a lower margin. Well, the fixed cost is of, of, of other goods. Yeah, but if you have Q star equals zero, mm -hmm. then your uh, your line is your budget constraint is up at the where the red line is. You should be. You should have a black dot up at the intersection of the red line, and then a black circle. Okay, right. I, I don't think it's going to make any difference for what you've done. No, that's right. I, I don't believe that black line actually touches the axis, but oh, uh, <laughs> my my artwork wasn't anyway intended to show that <laughs> that detail. Right. If you don't, and, and the model that I sent around in the paper it's done algebraically and then it says, you have an option of not paying the fixed costs and then not using that source. Definitely, yeah, thank you. So here's drawing it the other way where we look, same horizontal axis, but the vertical axis is now a price. And now we have a, we can see the situation, well, if I change my quantity from below Q star to above, that changes my price in a downward direction. Now there's other ranges where you change your quantity and have no effect on your price. Maybe in the red region, your marginal cost is constant. Maybe in the black region, your marginal cost again is constant. And that's where we kind of see the where, how you might get nonlinear dynamics. As people are moving through the constant marginal cost region, you get one sort of time series. And then as they move into the other region, you get an accelerated 
quantities, and then they slow down again. It's kind of a diffusion type of curve. So I, I'm just gonna show that here. We can do that with cost shifts, but I'm gonna show it with the demand shift. So I'll put a demand curve in here. Um, we'll start shifting it over time. And at first there's this early phase where, well, how much does the quantity increase? Well, it increases by the same amount the demand is shifting because the marginal cost is a constant. And we may get into a middle phase where the same demand shift results in a much bigger quantity change because people, as they consume more, they get a lower marginal cost and that makes them consume more again. It's a, a multiplier type of effect. Then you may have a later stage where people um, on the constant marginal cost case again, and then the rate slows down. The, the price here of the illicit manufactured good is a subtle concept in this because there's the binary cost, there's the monetary cost, uh, there's the, um, there's the uh, you know, psychic cost of doing something illegal, there's the stigma, which is going to be affected presumably by how many other people in your social network are using it. All of that can be changing at the same time, right? which is part of what's happening during this period of feedback on the level of your uh, black curve. Well, some of those things you mentioned are marginal costs. Others are also fixed or quasi-fixed. Right. Um, and I mentioned maybe increasing returns at a market level. That would be related to the friends and things like that. Right. right. Um, then when, when you operationalize this, there's hard work to be done in thinking about how to measure that price. Right, so the electricity are you just gonna take the street price? The main thing I'm going to lean on is that there was an era when the illicit was expensive. And then we're now in an era where it's cheap. And you're asking me, how would I know if it's 5x cheaper than prescriptions or 2.5x cheaper? I'd have to get into those issues. But I I think to say what I'm going to say today, I'm not going to have to okay. have that level of precision. Um, but the, the illegal stuff is often of low quality. The mortality risk is substantially higher even now than the legal stuff is, right? So. Some people say that. Now, when you're having fentanyl, you're getting a lot bigger quantity. So here, would be the question would be the risk per unit quantity. Well, do you, my problem is, do you know how much you're getting? Um, that, that argument has been made. Yeah. Um, Maybe true. I, I'm not going to try to dispute it. I'm not sure yeah. we should embrace it either. I mean, it's, I've it's, had fentanyl; it was fine. But it was after a medical procedure. <laughs> <laughs> Most of you have probably had it. I don't know. Yeah, I've had you. it too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 yeah. Clarify questions if I understand the model. Uh, if you have a needle exchange program or some some kind of like uh, uh, subsidized uh, approach to allowing people to more cheaply get, uh, more safely get. Uh, these illicit drugs, then the non-linearity tends to go away or, or, or is reduced in your model, is that right? Yeah, that fixed cost would be reduced and then the, the illicit would just dominate the prescription and you would get more traditional demand. Sorry. Going back to Steve's question, I think some of the mechanisms that he was describing and that I'm sure you described as well, do have the feel of turning something that's an individual decision into a pandemic, right? Because, because I'm fueling the local drug dealer, then there are more local drug dealers and it's easier for me to get the stuff and the fixed costs are lower and maybe there's less stigma and all of those things make it more like deciding individually. I agree with that. I, I'm showing an individual model today. That, that a lot of what's done in the literature is not individual level data. So if it's happening at a neighborhood level or a county level, predictions are pretty much the same. Um, but if you had individual data, you could start to focus on some of these distinctions. It seems like the dynamics would be different in the sense that you might be able to get more kind of shelling type behavior and more quickly into this kind of a situation into like a being brought into the classroom. So that might be useful for the time series. Yeah, yeah. Sort of a big group of networks. Then you might have a slower transition to 
it's more like macro than everything. It's not a, it's not a when you have the complementarities across people, the <coughs> aggregates are more elastic to whatever stimulus. I, I totally agree with that. What I'm making here is even without those things, we can have the epidemic type or diffusion type of dynamics just because the individual faces the nonlinear. Okay, so let's look a little bit at some prices. This is some more macro uh, pictures. And I wanted to start out with a uh, more familiar price series. This is the CPI for more or less textiles, boys apparel over the past 40 years or so. Notice the axis here I'm using is log scale. We're gonna look at some massive price changes. So I had to do things in logs. Um, and there's been a, a very big change in the price of textiles. They're, they're a lot cheaper. You can buy now 150% more <laughs> boys apparel with the same real income than you could 40 years ago. And that's imports for technology. On the bowl. The synthetic revolution, I think, is important in textiles. And the same question will come up with the fentanyl and, and, and heroin. There's both technology change there and, and imports. Here's a, the one, the most extreme one we know of is television sets, changed by a factor of 100 during this period. That's the big, beautiful television set we have here. Um, that seems too much. You have to take that up with the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, but. And the series I put together for illicit opioids, heroin, and fentanyl is somewhere in between these two. But still, we need to log scale, some being some big changes. Today, I'm going to focus on this last change, which is rather sudden and, and quite significant in, in itself, factor of three or four change, really fentanyl becomes available. And in many areas, totally displaces heroin, um, and, and the price is quite This is not the LS. This is the, who's, who's <laughs> 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 the other lines were. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say about the data a little bit? The, now, the illicit opioids is a uh, DEA. They go out there and sample. Um, they've been doing that for years purity and price of heroin especially. And then that heroin uh, increasingly has fentanyl in it and therefore more morphine gram equivalents of opioids per, per gram of whatever the dealer's handed it. And that's really the source of the big drop toward the end that you go to the heroin dealer and you're getting fentanyl. At first mixed and then now in many places, there's no such thing as heroin. So it's a different product. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, you have to ask the people who use it. They, they do notice some differences, but the morphine symptoms is especially what they're after. And, and that, um, they're pretty good substitutes in that sense. Again, you see these regions where heroin just totally displaced by fentanyl. <clears throat> That's why I sometimes have trouble believing these news stories to say, oh, people didn't know they got fentanyl. Wait a second, in, in your area, there's no such thing as heroin. You think you got heroin. That is, it's not anywhere around. It's, it's been totally beaten out. Um, but it makes it, it makes a good story with, I guess. Okay, so do you have the same kind of price level for a prescription? I'm gonna show you a prescription um, next. I don't have such a long time series. But again, that is something I show on a log scale. Um, there was a big earlier, earlier than the that drop I'm focusing on for heroin and fentanyl, you had to drop in prescription price from the consumer point of view. And Medicare Part D is a big part of it. Um, Medicare Part D was created, ends up purchasing the majority of prescriptions that are sold in the United States are purchased uh, either through Medicare or Medicaid. Medicare is much bigger than Medicaid, but Medicaid's a, a factor in there too, and that's driving the price change. Now that's that's a, a money price. There's a lot of regulation going on here. They're changing kind of the inconvenience, hassle cost, like Steve was talking about on the illicit side, but it's also true on the prescription side. 
they're trying to put barriers to using, uh, or maybe they would say abusing uh, prescriptions. But this is just a, a money prize. Now these are indices, so you can't compare one another and say, oh, opioids are cheaper than TVs or more expensive than TVs. They're indices, they're about the changes. What, what I will want to lean on today is that if you go back 20 years, 15 to 20 years ago, prescriptions were the cheap one. And heroin was there, but quite expensive. And then today, or 2019, 2018, we're in a situation where prescriptions are expensive. Per morphine gram equivalent, the illicit market's getting you a lot more per dollar. Can I just ask a clarifying question because I don't know the answer to this. On the supply side, is it that heroin is less elastically supplied because it's manufactured in a different way? It's kind of a natural product, whereas fentanyl is a synthetic, presumably it's manufactured quite differently. I'm just trying to understand what the supply curves are for these different forms. No, I, I did. These pictures I actually took from another paper where I focused more on that side. Fentanyl's perfectly elastically supplied because it's a manufactured, it's industrial chemicals. Of course, there's an opportunity cost of making fentanyl, but it's it's like people have less, a little bit less gas for their cars or something like that. It's uh, whereas with heroin, it's, there's a manufactured part of the process, but they're also growing poppies in the field, and you need more acreage, and and there's a that's a less. So so the incidence of some of these policies could be pretty different in the fentanyl world than the um, heroin world. I'm not going to talk about that today, but it's it's, it's interesting. I think important, it's especially in the pandemic, the elastic, the ability of the market to re respond with a large quantity in a short period of time, made a big difference in the pandemic. We saw that. Yeah. What do we know about the quantity of fentanyl and the energy? If you can see the prices, we know most of my quantity information comes from death certificates. So, sorry to be morbid, but. No, but just in terms of like drug seizures, like in the sense like how many seizures, what's the aggregate? It's kind of like the distribution of the size of the seizures. One thing that I have looked at is um, the seizures, they, they show the breakdown, how much meth, how much heroin, how much fentanyl, how much marijuana, how much cocaine. And those I've kind of looked at. And the fentanyl quantities there expand massively. It's a share of what ends up in the laboratory at the police station. I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but um, my NBR working paper, I show that, that I forget the uh, acronym for it, but it's the, it's the drug reports from the time lapse. And it's all proportional. Of course, most drugs don't get seized and ever make it in the prime fund. That's why I focus kind of on the proportional analysis. Yeah, I think it would be good to see that picture because you showed us this huge drop in life expectancy. Like in a sense, if you show us this massive expansion in the supply of these, we can get to it. So yeah, we well, it to follows the death certificates. What I show in the NBR working paper is follows the death certificates. So at the same time, people are, death certificates are recording, this guy died from fentanyl. We're also seeing the crime labs are finding a lot more fentanyl per unit cocaine, per unit marijuana. Um, it lines up very <clears throat> nicely. It's a statistical matter. Yeah, uh, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just saying like just putting the picture. Uh, I have that in the end oh, paper. paper. I didn't bring it, I didn't bring it today. The only quantities I'm gonna show you today are from death certificates. Quantity. Uh, people deceased. Okay, so. Now we've seen a little bit what's happened to the prices. Now let's get some more of these predictions from the, the same theory. I'm not changing the theory on you. Um, we talked about there are two prices to think about. They're moving differently. So let me draw a picture here where we hold the illicit price constant. We just ask, well, what happens to quantity as you vary the prescription price. Well, back in the day when the illicit price was quite high, kind of didn't matter what the prescription price is. That was people's source. You get a kind of standard demand curve. And that's what I've drawn here. But we also know that the illicit price fell after 2010, a lot. 
Um, and that's going to change this relationship. So now I'm drawing, drawing a second blue curve. Moving along that blue curve, the illicit price is constant, but at a much lower level. And here, illicit becomes an option for people, especially for the people facing the higher prescription prices. So you get this kind of a Laffer curve. In fact, analytically, it's almost exactly a, a Laffer curve um, type of relationship where over some range, higher prescription prices will mean less quantity, but over another range, it'll be more. So what, yeah. You, this is just a question out of my ignorance. So if, if it's not important to say so, but there's another source of dynamics here, which is anybody who for legitimate reasons takes fentanyl or one of the other, these other opiates, there's some small chance they become addicted. And I don't know whether that's true or how important that is, but if it is, then the big decline in the opioid price in the prescription markets that you showed also is entering here. And, and, and there isn't really an object like the one you've depicted here because it's, it's shifting over time as a function of past prices. So yeah. is nope. that an issue? or nope. Past prices are gonna matter. Um, so we're just let's, abstracting let's, from that. No, we're right? gonna use that a little bit and let, let's come back to it. Um, and I'll make my, make my comments then. Um, the race comparisons are going to be very interesting from the addiction perspective. And so let's come back to that when we get the race numbers. So what happened over time is you got an increase in quantity in, in theory. Not surprising because we had one of the prices fell. Okay, you're not surprised. But look what happened. We're going to a point in the demand curve where the prescription price no longer chokes off quantity. There have been a number of studies, not done by me, finding that, in fact, in the, about the year 2012, 2013, 2014, as they ramped up prescription regulations and made it harder for people to get prescriptions, they switched almost in the aggregate one for one, maybe even more than one for one, over to at the time it was heroin. So they were finding that demand curve is pretty flat. Maybe it's even sloping up. I'm not sure the studies are fine enough to tell that difference. Um, and they also said it has something to do with the illicit market as being different. Yeah, so, so, uh, just, just a modeling decision about this. So uh, in, the, in the prescription market, the way that they limited demand is by making it more difficult to get prescriptions from doctors. Right? So I have lots of my friends that tell, they tell me about drug-seeking behavior from, from patients. Um, the doctors, they're, they're, if you give a prescription, now you're on some DEA list, and they're just double checking. They're like link, linking and seeing how many, how many so, it's, so it's just much, much more difficult. Is, is the right way to model that a, pri a price increase in the prescription, or is it the right way to model that a fixed cost, just the same way you're modeling a fixed cost of, of, of fentanyl in the same market? I, I think of, now that's a little bit later than we're looking about at here. And certainly the studies I mentioned were looking more at where the pharma company changed the formulation of its prescription so that it was more difficult to abuse. Um, I think it would yeah. you probably model <clears throat> that red line in your first graph going down what? for the relative gap, that gap. I mean, there's some of each. I mean, you get you go to a doctor. He gives you some pills and then you run out and then you got to go to another doctor and talk him into it, right? And that, so there's a marginal cost and a fixed cost. You get a skill at this, you start to figure out which doctors are easy. So there, I think there's both types of costs. Um, but that would be, those kind of regulations were coming in, especially I think the paper I sent around has a whole uh, data set on the federal regulations. They were coming in around 2018, 2017, 2019. Which is too bad in a sense because that's when they change from a brake pedal to a gas pedal. If your intention was to reduce the number of death certificates, it's too bad. This is a big deal for policy when there was an era where pulling this policy lever would reduce mortality, and now this same lever pulled in the same direction increases mortality. That's something a policymaker would uh, want to know. What, why is that? I'm not. I don't think I agree with that. Why, why is that? How have we identified the fact that 
first of all, I, I don't know what the policy lever is, but second, how do we identify that the policy lever caused the increase in deaths? I don't understand. There's a couple different issues we're talking about here. One is, what is the effect of changing the prescription price? And that's gotten a lot of study, and it also gives us some light on kind of what part of the model we're in here. Are we on that before 2010 type of curve, or are we on the more of the Laffer curve? And yes, prescriptions went down in the past decade. That's true. Well, more true like statement. around the Medicare Part D in that era. Well, when Part B was adopted, that was a price decline. Prescriptions yeah. went up. That's true. Oh, I thought you meant the price. Okay. Right. The price went down. The prescriptions went up. Then in the 2010 to 2019 period, <clears throat> prescriptions went down. Yes. Okay. okay. So we're switching to something else. So that, right, this, I didn't this, understand. this horizontal axis is the total quantity. Your quantity, whether regardless of where you sourced it from. So yes, prescriptions go down. Yeah. But here, and these studies are focused on heroin. It's before fentanyl. Heroin goes up. Right. But what was the policy lever? I don't. I understand. think what Casey was saying is that they started making it more difficult to get the the, the RX. Therefore, people switched to the illicit and consumed more of the more of the substances, and that increased consumption resulted in more. So, I mean, this is a, this is a broader big picture question, maybe, which is that. You know, there, there are sort of three facts here, right? That prescription use went down, illicit use went up, and illicit use per use got way more dangerous, right? Those are the three facts. And this model is consistent with those facts. I, I believe that. But there's lots of other models that are I also agree. consistent. I agree. Okay, so, but then, why would we use this model to predict out into the future when there's lots of models that are consistent with the facts? I mean, you know, I'm saying. I got 30 minutes, I'll talk about one model. And it's gonna say some surprising things that people have ignored. For example, the Stanford Commission that was just a few months ago, did it mention this at all? That the policy lever that used to increase, reduce deaths might be increasing deaths. <clears throat> And they also didn't talk about the race things that I'm about to show you. I'll let you go. Yeah. I'll let you go. I'm sorry. But I think what Tyler was trying to emphasize I know. in Casey's model is the idea that once you make, once you pay the fixed cost to switch to the illicits, then even if the fentanyl were not stronger, you would still have paid the fixed cost. So then you're in this different marginal cost environment. Yep. But what I'm saying is that you don't you don't need that feature to explain any of these empirical regularities. That those those empirical regularities can be explained by all kinds of things. So since we haven't rejected those, I don't know what do, do you have a preferred alternative explanation? Yes, yes, yeah. Well, look, Casey, I'll, I'll tell says, you my preferred here what he says, <laughs> Okay, so now let's let's look at some of the race data. So this is a chart of drug deaths over time, separate series for blacks and for whites. And for many years, the mortality rate was higher for whites. Case indeed in, in their book, they started writing their book when they had about this much data that I'm showing you. They put a whole chapter in there. What the heck is going on? Why is the mortality rate lower for the blacks than for the whites? And they have a kind of preference or sociological explanation. Um, they view it kind of a puzzle they're trying to solve. They don't really look at prices. Prices may not only help explain this, but I'm also, also tell you what's gonna come next. It does tell you what's going to come next. Whether it's the only story for what comes next, we'll see. So go, I'm going to go back to the picture now. I'm going to put blacks and whites in there. I'm going to put blacks in at a higher prescription price. And a lot of people have argued due to access to insurance and things like that, that blacks face a somewhat higher prescription price than whites do. 
And then this picture would say, well, they would consume less. Now, you didn't need me to come today and say, hey, if there's a group that pays a higher price, they have a lower quantity. You don't need me for that. But what happens after 2010 when you have a different prescription price relationship because of what's going on in the illicit market? I'm putting the same curve there. We're going to jump to that other curve. Both races will jump to the other curve. And what this theory makes a quite a bold prediction. It says, okay, yeah, they're going to be increased quantity for both races, but it's going to increase more for blacks. Even bolder than that is the blacks are going to pass up the whites. I'm just saying that they're going to catch up. During a period when the white mortality rate is going to be going up a lot, the black one's going to go up even more to pass them up. That's a bold prediction. Maybe you can get it from other places, but um, that's a bold prediction. And let's look at whether it's now, correct. In the, in the previous slide, it looks like in 2015, blacks had a lower death rate. Yeah. Okay. And furthermore, this this approach not only says this difference between blacks and whites, but it say which types of people, older people versus younger people. We were talking earlier about how well people who have higher demand levels are going to be earlier to do this switching business. Well, we know that the Older people, I don't mean like great grandmothers, but people over 30 or 40 years old, they consuming more because they've built up a tolerance, they're addicted, like Steve said earlier, where the younger people, your teenagers, are consuming lower quantities. They have a they in a sense to get the same feeling, they need uh lesser quantities. So the switching is gonna make less sense for them. So let's look at that. Um this is an important enough point. I want to explain the same thing in a different way, more. Algebraic way, there's two prices that determine the quantity. Something changed in the illicit market that changed the sign of the effect of the prescription price. Well, that's true. And a key difference between blacks and whites is that prescription price. Then it's going to change the sign of the race gap. That's the same argument made in an algebraic uh, way. So, so, so here's just what, yeah. Clear before we go on. In terms of both of these slides. So if we look at your previous slide, the 2019 aggregate demand curve, sort of as a backwards um, spending uh, aggregate demand curve, but that's just how you drew it, right? It doesn't have to backward bend at that point. It could have kept going some other direction, right? So I know that you could get this effect whereby blacks eventually supersede whites in terms of the drug-induced deaths. But that's just a schematic diagram. It's not like we know that this well, is I have a, I actually skipped that part, I should have mentioned. In the paper, I have a theorem, uh, or Proposition 5, that says that if the only difference between Blacks and whites is the prescription price, then the Blacks must pass up the whites when the illicit price gets low enough. And that, that, that's a theorem. But, but it's not the only difference between blacks. I, I understand, <laughs> but I understand, but we shouldn't be surprised by this. I didn't hear the people saying who were puzzling about why are the black whites lower than yeah. the white whites saying, yeah. by the way, the blacks are just about to pass up the whites. So, so this is a, I, a, so, a, so, Kate, I think you're making a useful point. There, there's a there's a different explanation for the phenomena that you put on the table. <clears throat> I guess what some people are asking for is, and I don't know here, I don't know the answer to this. Is there enough spatial variation, say, across states in this in the RX price that you could replicate your black-white comparison across the 50 states or across the 50 states by race? Is there is there enough variation in the data to make that a an informative exercise and see whether we see this pattern repeatedly where you would expect it? The I, I, that could be investigated. The literature on the difference between blacks and whites in terms of the prescription access is not a state level analysis. Maybe it could right. be taken but to I, a state level. But my my understanding, again, I may be wrong, is that prescribing practices differ a lot across areas, so that the implicit cost of obtaining the legal drug might differ across areas, and the timing of the change in these prescribing practices might differ across states in ways that would allow you to extend your but would it be different for blacks and whites? 
No, no, but it'd be different across states. So you could just, the same, I want to take the same analytical framework you've given us and try to use it to explain spatial variation. <laughs> well, that's what the studies I mentioned were doing that. Okay. They weren't focused on race. They were, that's but, how they try to make the claim that you're on this flat part of the, and the aggregate were on the flat part because they're looking at these different states and some of them had more Oxycontin than others. And when, when the Oxycontin product changed to make it harder to abuse, what mortality changes do you get differentially by states? That's the whole literature. I haven't okay. contributed to that, but I'm using it heavily. Okay, but is, that, is, is the variation that that literature uses helpful in disentangling this explanation from other? I don't know what the other explanations are. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it seems to have some of mine, and so I presume there are some literature. But well, oh, yeah, I mean, you, you can explain all this by just uh, practice patterns changing and fentanyl is cheaper, right? Those two things explain it. You don't need <laughs> that generates. And the, the black-white differentials are essentially all because of contamination of non-opioid illicit drugs. That's essentially what's, okay. what's happening. I mean, you have a two-part story to explain two data points. That's fine. Right. As opposed you want to use a different theory for the race gap than for these other things? No. The, the two things that happened was that practice patterns changed Fentanyl got cheaper. Those happen. That explains all of this. That's all I'm saying. No, you still threw contamination in. I was listening. You still oh, yes. contamination is an additional bell and whistle on the explanation machine, which is fine. Doesn't make it wrong. But I. But you go to so if Steve's thing happened. though. So <laughs> so is it the case that in states where the prescription price fell by more, the deaths increased by more? Do other studies show that? Because that would be that would be some evidence in. No, they didn't. I mean, that's other way around. Sorry, other way around. The other way around. Sorry. But yeah, and you could add to that to see if the re if the relative mortality of blacks versus whites changed in response to those state level changes. Yeah. The other the other nice thing about the state test is that <clears> there are fifty states, well, okay, forty eight continental states or whatever, whereas there are only two races. So it's given the fact that you might have bigger differences among the states and their Rx prices, that would give you more variation as a test. So I think I think Steve's proposed um, robustness test seems like a good one. Yeah, that hasn't been done. Uh, it's, they've been using all the races pulled together. But when they do all the races pulled together, does it go in the direction that you're saying? But by state. Well, what I'm saying, I'm just repeating what they found. That circa 2012, 2013, 2014, you raise the prescription price and you don't reduce deaths. You have a big switch from prescription deaths okay. to the other type of deaths. But you don't increase deaths either. They kind of, I'm not sure they're fine enough to. Is it a one and for nobody's one? Nobody's done that. Okay, so, so, so I, I agree, Steve. Somebody should do what Steve's saying. It shouldn't be hard. Yes, the, they're confidential. You may have to sign with the agency and everything, but that's what people are using state level test certificates. Why don't you show us the next chart? So then the, um, right when Case and Deaton are writing their book about why the white rate is above the black rate, then no longer ends up being true. Um, as in 2019. Now this, my approach not only says that this would eventually happen if the illicit price got low enough, but also says what groups it would happen first among. So that here's, in this picture, I've changed it to a gap. So I'm not showing a separate black series and a white series. I've taken the difference between the two. This is black uh, minus white. So a negative means the black rate is lower than the white. What I've also done here is control for some demographics, which kind of important here is controlling for the census division. There's nine of them in the country. This is relevant because the distribution of people, of blacks among the regions of the United States is not the same as the distribution among whites in the United States. And the fentanyl rolls out somewhat differently in these places. So it makes somewhat of a difference to control for that. I've done that here. Um, but still you see the, the gap changes sign. It's almost 
change signed by 2019. This is for all the ages. Now let's break it down by age, because remember this theory said that it's gonna happen first among the older people because they have the higher quantity levels. And so that's what I've done here. I've added red is the older people, 45 and older, and the blue is the younger people, 44 and younger. And you can see the, the passing up happens earlier for among the older. So this is a race gap among older people, and then blue is a race gap among younger people. Hasn't changed sign yet. The, the white rate is still above the black rate among um, younger people. And maybe it'll never pass forward. But the dispersion has changed big time. Yes. I mean, it's, again, a part of the increase in returns tends to generate dispersion. Mm -hmm. It makes the high consumption people consume more and the low consumption people consume less. So your Medicare would be a, a natural. What's happening with? Oh, uh, yeah. So, so like, you know, access to these kind of illicit, of, the, of uh, these painkiller drugs in hospice, for instance, is much easier. That's a Medicare policy. Interesting to, to be used with 65 and up. Yeah, the 45 plus is, largely driven by 45 to 64. And there's, the elderly population is an interesting case. Um, in, in fact, the Dan mentioned the prescription is going down a lot uh, and it has generally happened, but the elderly has been a different dynamics the, on the, the prescription. The kind of fraud I'd heard about in the elderly is uh, you have relatively easy access to prescription or painkillers, then you resell it on the black market. Yeah. Um, so they can have some. Spill I've over. seen that happen in Walgreens in Chicago, with my own <laughs> eyes. There weren't many grandmothers doing that, but enough grandmothers doing it at scale that. It, yeah, you just well, you just need some a couple, some entrepreneur to walk walk around the neighborhood and say, "Can you give me your extra pills?" There was a study that found that when Medicare Part D rolled out, and places with more elderly people living around there, that the death rate of the non-elderly people went up. Um, okay, so that the last- So we have a question from yeah. you, It's not, okay. Now the last result to show is the young and the old. Um, youth, let me say youth, adults and minors, I mean M-I-N-O-R-S, so the same picture that we did before, the adults are gonna have a higher demand level and therefore they're gonna respond differently to a prescription change. So I wanna go back to that uh, regulation or change in the formulation around 2010 that increases more the non-pecuniary part of the RX price. So that goes up, doesn't affect the illicit price, as this was about a regular pharmaceutical product. And for the younger people, it would reduce their, or anybody, any group with a low demand level, it's gonna reduce their consumption. You get the kind of normal law of demand, naive law of demand prediction. But for people with higher level consumptions, they're gonna respond, potentially could respond by consuming more. And so you get this divergence. So here's, the death certificate data, the younger youth, minors, M-I-N-O-R-S, um, up through 2010. Here you see some standard error bars because when you're dealing with youth, there's small enough samples that the sampling error is actually interesting. Everything else I've shown you, the samples are so huge that they even bother to show you these microscopic standard errors. Um, they're kind of, kind of tracking each other. They're at different levels, of course, um, for a variety of reasons, but they're tracking each other. And then after 2010, the youth deaths fell, at least until the pandemic, and the um, adult deaths went up. Do we see that as well? In the sense that I think the prescription regulations were intended to reduce mortality from opioids. Who knows the intentions, but I think that was the intention. Kind of worked among younger people. Uh, well, it's harder to see an effect among older people. And overall, opioid deaths. If you look at deaths from prescriptions, that would be different because of the switching that's happening among 
among the adults. And then you come back to the addiction issue that Steve raised. You know, maybe there'll be a dividend from this in later years, you'll have cohorts who aren't as addicted because the younger people didn't have prescriptions. That might be something that could happen. Although I'll go back to the race picture. I know this story that, well, the, the companies, one of the favorite things we did in the White House is like to criticize the companies. Both Democrats and Republicans like to do that. Um, the companies have been blamed. Well, they pushed out OxyContin, people got addicted and they couldn't give it up and they switched to fentanyl. But the blacks weren't getting the OxyContin. And somehow they pass up the whites who were getting the OxyContin. There must be something more to the story than just blaming, uh, blaming the companies. Yeah. On the black-white comparison, uh, in, in the literature, not in what you're doing, but what you, the fact about the difference in uh, access for blacks and whites is purely a question of insurance. Is that how, is that how this is? The Stanford that's... Commission, which actually which I agree, I, I, I would agree with a, a little bit on that uh, on this issue. They point to lower insurance rates, um, and that's been documented in other studies. Yes. Uh, insurance, but then they also say, well, maybe the doctors. I mean, part of the game here was you go to the doctor and you say, "I'm hurting," and he's supposed to or she is supposed to listen to you and say, "You're hurting. I'll give you a pill," and not question that. And it's been claimed that, well, the black patient gets more questions and the white patients is kind of allowed to be the Yeah, best. I know that's it, but that argument about equity, and but I'm, I'm just wondering how do people know that? I'm not sure how, how they know. I mean, insurance rates I can understand because we can, you can document that, yeah. but I've always wondered about this question about um, equity Prescription I mean, there's some behavior. Is there? There's some studies that will look at you know patients coming out of the same hospital mm -hmm. and going home with different amounts of prescriptions mm -hmm. to take home. So, Casey, is it a nice testable implication of your model here, going back to the states or maybe UFC divisions or some distance that seems to all? That if I'm a black person in an area where maybe I face high prescription prices, but there are a whole bunch of white and maybe white elderly people around me who are, uh, you know, for them, they're the ones who are really switching into the market. They pay the fixed cost to make that market exist. And then once the market exists, mm -hmm. I have access to a better market. Whereas if I live in some place where there are no white people and I'm a black person, there are no places in the United States where only black people live. But anyway, there are fewer, there are too few white people to support the market. Even though I might want to switch, so following your model, right? If it's a higher RX price, so I'm I would like to move over more and increase opioids more. No one has paid the fixed cost to make the market exist. So I don't actually do the switch. Because the switch should really happen with the whites kind of leading the blacks into the illicit. Words, right? And there are there are big differences among different areas of the United States in the black to white ratio. I, I, I've used the phrase "switch" to make it sound like a longitudinal thing that I follow a social security number and then they change their behavior, and a lot of that happens. But also, I'm just thinking of new cohorts coming in a different situation, and there's some cohorts that are kind of on the margin between these, and then, and there are some. I said the young people are prescription intensive, and they are, but they're a lot less prescription intensive than they used to be. So you have what I've called a switch is, can be more of a comparative static. But still, you, one could look at that. The studies I mentioned don't uh, look at race. They have it. I mean, they're using death certificates and race is a variable there, but they haven't. And it, there wasn't a lot of interest. One of the, another reason, I'll show you the part that, that, that Deaton was looking at there was a lot of interest in opioids among blacks because it seemed like a non-issue, right? And it's really been only, this data hasn't been available more than a few months. Um, there wasn't really an awareness that the blacks had passed the whites, let alone participating in this type of health issue. Casey, yeah. is it, um, can you distinguish between the proposition that it is the government policy that's making prescription uh, more expensive? 
versus lax government policy that's allowing for illicit prescriptions price to fall. But both of them, it's a relative price that the union Well, we're, I mean, we do know that the level of the illicit price has fallen a lot. Right. And, and now, why is that? I mean, I hope it's clear the illicit price matters a whole lot here. So we'd like to understand why is it falling? And certainly the technology, I think, has to be part of the story. Is law enforcement part of the story? I mean, you're not allowed to ask that question, but it'd be good to ask. When, when, when we had these criminal justice reforms, there was not a discussion, might we be reducing prices of illicit drugs? Might more people die from that? There was not a discussion. It would be nice to have one. Um, the criminal justice reform at the federal level was in 2013. Pure coincidence <clears throat> that fentanyl comes in our country on a permanent basis in 20, the end of 2013. Pure coincidence, of course, that when the Chinese fentanyl came in the United States, 2014, around January 1, it also came in Sweden, same time. Pure coincidence that the Swedish police, drug enforcement people fought back hard and they don't have fentanyl there. And we still have it. I, these things ought to be investigated. I'm, I'm not allowed to talk about causality, but these, these things yeah. have happened at similar times and, and, and similar Places. What happened with the age difference in fatality rates since 2010? I mean, I you, you read that everyone reads that there's a huge spike in 2020 and 2021 among adolescents, but do we know? I think you that graph stopped in 2010. We must have some more data. Uh, I, I, no, what, your printout is. Uh, yeah, you don't have the dynamic. Printout. Oh, I was looking away when. Yeah. Um, That's what I missed. Sorry. Thanks. I missed that. Um, I wanted to follow up on what Nakhani asked. So, in terms of like whether there is difference in terms of like, evidence that physicians vary by age, and how they respond to the pain of Lisa Marcella Alsan, one of my colleagues at Harvard, she has a paper where she created a clinical and, and randomly whether you saw a same race doctor or a different race what she found is that in terms of uptake of preventable services, you actually saw that folks who were coming in with the same baseline level of kind of problems, they were more likely to be the same race doctor to elect for like more preventable care. Mm -hmm. And so that literature is burgeoning that there is evidence that's I think that's a useful thing to look at. I think the other piece too, like going back to the point about the spatial variation, I completely agree with that point. I think that, that would be very compelling in fact you could perhaps do this within race. And so if you were to look at figures of whites across different regions or different states, were there certain states where we saw a divergence on uptick? And then is that divergence within the same racial category also correlated with differences across states in place? Right? Because in some sense, like your, your paper precisely is that this has nothing to do with race. This really has to do with the prices. And so why not control for that? And just look within race, but then across space where there's heterogeneity in the prices. And then if you can show that, I think that that would be incredibly persuasive both for whites and then also for blacks. Yeah, now the illicit prices are tricky to measure. But there's some attempt at that, and it work work could be done. I mean, the DEA its survey is has a regional component to it. There, there's some crowdsourcing data too on illicit prices too. Um, and it's like streetrx.com or something like that. I know they did some work in 2012, but there could be any, and even if you had like something that was cross-sectional today, and you could say that there's some permanent level of differences across space, that could be something that at least that would be suggestive. And yeah, we do have the, uh, we had a, there's a Princeton dissertation recently that looked at, I think it was Street RX. And they were looking at illicit prescription. Now that they didn't have fentanyl and heroin in, in that, um, and there was definitely it was city level, definitely city differences. So these are feasible projects that, that you're talking about, but they haven't haven't been done yet. 
So Casey had kind of a policy question out of this. And so essentially, this is a story about, let's take your story about unintended consequences. So you thought you were going to get one thing, you got another. Uh, the interesting policy question uh, is, you, you don't want to say one never makes an intervention because of unintended consequences. Was, was, was it at all foreseeable that this might have been the uh, consequence? I think from an economic point of view, the change in law enforcement would affect the price of what those criminals were selling. I think it was fairly clear. I did some estimates around, you know, the amount of time in prison, if that's passed on to the customer in terms of prices, what would be the effect on the, on the price? It's, it's not so different than what actually happened. I mean, you're, it's billions of dollars. Um, I mean, that was part of the reason for the criminal justice reforms. Is, well, this is a big cost to the criminal, but what if the customer is paying that cost? We kind of understand the kind of magnitudes at stake. So I think it was something you should have expected. I think some of us did. We were working on this in the White House in 2018 and 2019, and these were kind of issues we were getting into before we had the data I've shown you today. Um, and that we had these kind of concerns. Condi, are you talking about the restrictions on prescribing licit or talking about the ostensible reduction in punishment for illicit? Well, those are two different uh, policy uh, levers, right? Yeah. One had to do with criminal justice reform. Another has to do with the way that you control prescriptions. Right. And one interesting thing is you probably need to tease those out, right? They may not have had exactly the same effect, and they're kind of conflated. Yes. Here. And what I'm asked, because as a policymaker, um, you do try to understand the consequences of the White House. We were kind of concerned about this. Uh, I, I guess I'm asking in a more systematic way if this had been given to you as a for the Council of Advisors, and you were able to, to set up a, uh, an actual research design that would say, what, if I vary this, what response am I going to get here? Uh, would you have been able to do that? Is this what you would have set up? And would you have been able to see that you know, the predictive capabilities of predictive outcome is X, Y, or Z? So there is a way to do this, right? If you're a policymaker, we don't always do it. But as academics, we do an actual research design and we say, here are the possible uh, triggers of this outcome. It was it possible to see that yeah. coming? Well, it, what I'm trying to add in, is in the kind of a middle step there, where how can we generalize from the research designs that have already been executed? Like these studies that were on the flat part of the lab curve. They weren't about race. But I have economic theory can help me generalize that and say, does the, do those findings have anything to say about race, even though race is not mentioned in the paper? And I think this framework is a very clear answer to that. Yes, you should be concerned that, that the race uh, gap is gonna change, change signs. And there are other examples like that. When you've seen one price change, how do you recognize other price changes, like I think Steve mentioned the, the non-pecuniary costs and pecuniary costs. Well, maybe those are in a kind of a same metric. And the responses to the pecuniary costs are maybe telling about what the responses to the non-pecuniary costs are. Um, but that is a more fundamental implication of your framework is we need to think about alternative sources of supply. Choke off the legal, and that's true whether you're talking right. economic yeah. sanctions, right. prescription mm -hmm. drugs, and it's, so. It's true of almost any. Yeah. So you got to think about both describe. the existing alternative sources and the potential for creating yeah. new ones. Yes, and and maybe that wasn't done enough in this case. I mean, it's an argument I had with the FDA. They, they refuse to, to recognize well, the consequences of their rules for illicit markets. Yeah. Just don't do it on principle. They, lawyers will tell me why that's not our jurisdiction. <laughs> but yes, a cost-benefit analysis has to look at the outcome with your regulation versus the outcome without your regulation. So what would you do? What would you do to fix this? 
I didn't even get in question whether something's broken. I, I mean, I had the macro <laughs> pictures like there's technological <laughs> progress. Oh, sure, that's the answer. Uh, this is technological progress. That well, what do you do about it? Does it matter? I mean, it was good. Good. What was good? I mean, what's your stance on the war on drugs is kind of what you're asking. Uh, yes. I mean, I see both sides. I used to only see the Milton Friedman side. Now I kind of see both both sides of it. I mean, Matt, a lot of medical problems we've had in the past, whether it be cholera or AIDS, other things, we didn't solve them by kind of becoming like monks and living in a monastery. We solved them or alleviated them with medical innovation. So I would like to think that this issue will evolve with medical innovation. Well, what what, what we'll be, law enforcement. So we'll talk about that. I mean, that's the war on drugs question. Yeah. I, I see both sides of it now, I'm like I didn't used to, but it, I think medical innovation is there ways new going to be new ways to treat addiction. But is that even allowed to have research on that? There's a lot of policy barriers to medical innovation, right? I, I, I've been studying it. Yes, by yeah, studying yeah. psychedelics is one area where they're trying to do research. You know, can can psychedelics help people? Yeah. Get off of opioid addiction, and it, they got big legal problems in investigating them. Yeah, they're, all, they're all like drugs, like methadone and all that. Uh, yeah, which are, yeah, which are easy that. They're not effective. I mean, I, I'm just struck by the 2020 effect for, kid, for kids. <clears throat> You're talking like hundreds of kids, basically dying in in the pandemic, with this huge increase in in demand for op opioids ha happening for them. Um, and so, like, like this, this is this is one of these things where, like, there, there is some psychological aspect of this. Like, there's, there's like depression skyrocketing in, in youth, uh, like one in four young adults seriously considering suicide around this time. Um, so, yeah, like, <clears throat> it's, this is it's it's, it's going to be a complicated story. Can I just follow on that? I look, I take that more from your discussion, but also the broader discussion. There's a tremendous variety of sources of supply of drugs that make people feel better, self that lead them to self-medicate. And that suggests to me, a psych, the anti-addiction approach you describe is one basic message. But another one is we need to shift the level of the demand curve through non-price, through, through other mechanisms, like leaving the underlying sources of depression that are, that are driving people to self-medicate. Or that you know, you know, we've lost the perhaps to some extent the stigma that was once associated with taking certain drugs, and maybe you know there was a big cost for losing that stigma um, because it's basically a, you know, in your framework that translates into a, an outward shift in the demand, and that's especially dangerous for addictive products when the supply sources are so plentiful and cheap which is a change from the past. So we've lost the stigma at a time mm -hmm. when the, 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 the I mean, it's not the right word, the ability to get it easily addicted is greater than it was in yeah. the past. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, just again, from a policy point of view, because, uh, you know, you know, international war on drugs too, which is really fighting through. So one reason I think it's important to tease out which of these variables is actually most important in producing the outcome is, so what you're talking about here with law with a judicial or law enforcement reform or criminal reform is basically sort of mild decriminalization. And there's a whole now movement toward mild decriminalization. First you decriminalize marijuana, now we're we'll thinking about because prohibition never worked and so forth and so on. That actually I think might be a more important explanator of what we're seeing than what the price was. And what I'd really like to know is how much is explained by price and explained by differences in prescription um, uh, prescription regulation, uh, how much is explained by race and the response to different race and how much is, is um, decriminalization? Because that's the only way as a policymaker, people are gonna do something. They're not going to just sit by and let this happen. So the way that I like to think about it, almost econometrically, is which one's going to give me the most powerful explanation? And that's why I think it would be really interesting to try to tease this out more so that there's not a kind of conflation of several 
it might have been uh, what I'm calling mild decriminalization. It might have been changes in uh, price. It might have been which was driven by changes in prescribing behavior, et cetera, or prescribing um, regulation, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That's kind of the interesting policy problem. Yeah. Can I point out just a basic a basic point that I think we all ought to be very cautious about interpreting data from the years 2020 and 2021, mm -hmm. because your story, if it's correct, right, should go on post-pandemic. It really shouldn't be. Uh, maybe young people, it's spiking up in 2020 because they're out of school and they're adolescents and they're not in high school and so forth and so on. And if it goes back to trend line, then we would say, oh, okay, maybe that was the pandemic. And the pandemic may have affected young people differently than it affected older people. I'm just saying cautious about 2020 and 2021. And that's, we should yeah. try to get out a little bit more to 2023 or something. It's another like explanatory variable. Yes, yes. Well, the pandemic is such a, yeah. is very, unfortunately, it's since we only had just the one, yeah. it's, it's, not, it's not all that useful as an explanatory variable. Although some of the states differ. I have a paper where I looked at the $600 and $300 bonuses in drug and alcohol deaths. And those, stopped at different times in the red and blue states. And, and, it, and it looks like, now they did not go back to trend in the red states, but they did go back, started back toward their trend sooner than they did in the blue states. Can you, up, yes, uh, you, can you update this chart? Oh, in 2019. Yeah, I, I, uh, is it, is it I may have it in this, it dives way down in COVID, both from COVID and from drugs. And from a bunch of other things. It goes down about two years. Yeah. And the drugs and alcohol by themselves contribute about a third of the year. Uh, things like diabetes and mm -hmm. circulatory diseases contribute about a half a year. COVID itself contributes about a year or a little more. I mean, that's the that's the most striking chart in a sense. So we're just about out of time. Any more? Questions what about from the, the Zoom world? Anything from the Zoom world? Fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Usually I expect Cochran. He's always the first guy to <laughs>